Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode. I am so excited to introduce our guest on the show today, a Vedic astrologer, and Mal. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me here. So I want to kickstart this episode and ask you, when was the first time you felt something spiritually or felt like you were connected mm -hmm. to something bigger than yourself? Okay, so with that, actually it happened a lot of times, but uh, one incident I could remember was 2017. Uh, it was the time when uh, I was actually I started with my Sarasati and astrologically and it was a major transformative period for me and I was uh, like a lot of things were happening in my personal life which got me into that transformative phase and uh, I was thinking a lot about how to get out from that you know there is that uh, moment when you don't realize that uh, uh, what to do at that very moment and that was the moment when i realized that there is something much much uh, greater than uh, uh, this earth plane right so i used to preach a lot shiva a lot and uh, that was the moment i realized that i have something in me which is more towards spiritual spirituality and uh, i went into spirituality and i started meditating it was actually very difficult in the beginning because it was like a lot of traumas come back to you when you meditate and there's like a, a, a lot of crying uh, emotions waves of emotions all of that so that's how my journey began wow so yeah. were you already studying vedic astrology at this point yes i was because i started vedic astrology like when i was just 16 years old wow and this is back in 2017 i think i was 21 back then wow so yeah when were you first introduced to vedic astrology Okay, so uh, for the very first time, I was like very, very small. And uh, my mother used to get some books, you know, there's one book you might know of, there's a red book, Lal Kitab, we call it in uh, Hindu Sanskriti. So my mother used to get those books and uh, she used to read that. I was very small, I didn't have any understanding of anything. So what happened was uh, I used to see her doing something, making some charts and some people used to, her friends used to come home and they used to ask her about things and she used to tell them things. So I, I have been a part of such a conversation. But uh, then when I grew up, I saw my cousin and mother discussing over astrology a number of times. And that was the point when I was introduced to astrology and I was introduced to my mentor by my cousin who was Kapil Raj. And then I started uh, watching his videos and uh, eventually I started being uh, interested into Vedic astrology and I learned it for like good eight years. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah. It's such a lifetime of knowledge. Like you're just exactly. constantly learning and constantly evolving exactly. with it. When did you start to take it on as more of like a full-time thing for you? Or uh -huh. like, okay, this is going to become my thing. Okay, so that was, uh, I guess, back in 2019. I completed my studies. Uh, it was actually, um, you know, not completed. Uh, I, I didn't used to go to college because, you know, that is the teenage. You want to I be isolated. You don't want to connect to a lot of people. So I was going through that phase. And, you know, when it's about uh, your transformation, astrologically, when it's about your transformation period, you tend to find a lot of answers. So just in order to find a lot of answers, I was, I did, I, I was like more into Vedic astrology, though I was learning it before that also, but that was the point when I started learning it like 24 hours a day. I used to sleep for, I guess, two to three hours wow. only. And I used to just learn, learn, learn. Wow. Yeah. I, I love, I love all of that. And what was the first aspect about astrology that you learned where it really just like hit you and you were like, there's something deeper here and I, I want to explore more. Okay, so one thing that is, uh, you know, very much associated with the Vedic astrology is like here in India, people don't take astrology as something uh, like we consider it as a pseudoscience. We consider it as a science, basically. But uh, in India, people are more towards superstition. 
right they consider astrology to be something to be scared of right so i used to talk and discuss with a lot of people about it and all i uh, used to um, you know hear was that what are the remedies what should be done uh, how can we save ourselves so nobody understood that there is much more uh, to it you know there's much more logical explanation to it so that was the time when i uh, i understood that there is a way to make to change the perception of people so that was my main focus and that was something that used to irritate me at the first when people used to say that because this is something my passion is right so when somebody say says something opposite to what you are passionate about you get agitated totally. so this was my main focus to you know uh, bring a change towards vedic astrology i love that so much and that's part of why i really connected with your yeah. offerings and how you really teach Vedic mm -hmm. astrology because I feel the same way. I feel that um, growing up more around Western astrology, I was always fascinated mm -hmm. with the stars and cosmology. And when I started to realize that, because um, I started in my journey with learning about Ayurveda, and then I got into yeah. um, learning about Jyotish after. And so then I started to realize that the reason why Jyotish had been not forgotten, but not it was overlooked in Western societies yeah. because it was said to be this predictive astrology itself. Yeah. It felt really constricting. It felt like really narrow minded. And then yeah. I started to hear from some of my friends um, who grew up in an Indian family and who grew up around other Vedic astrologers that that validated their experience and that they were told yeah. things that they were um, doomed and gloomed almost. And that like really yeah, shocked okay. me and took me aback. I was grateful that I've always had a mentor who had proper lineage and um, learned from his guru and, and whatnot, which is really important with learning in Vedic astrology, but that was so wild to me. Did you have any experiences yeah. when you were younger of getting a Vedic astrology reading that felt disconnected and in that way? Yeah, it was. I remember, uh, like, uh, although all the astrologers used to say very good things about my chart but there was one time when uh, there was an astrologer i went to him and he just you know made me uh, a bit scared about everything and that was also related to this sad sati period and rahu mahadasha and you must have heard about rahu people have n number of bad things to say about rahu so it was just the starting period of it and it actually came along uh, together my Sarasati and my Rahu Mahadasha. I'm talking about 2017, back in 2017. So uh, there was a, an, an astrologer who simply told me that you are going to get ruined. You are going to have no money. You're going to be, uh, you know, bankrupt. Uh, you don't, uh, you won't have any friends and all of that. And I can't tell you how bad it felt. And uh, I was very, very demotivated at that point. But in a way, I would say that was a negative motivation for me that made me do a lot of things that I have done till now. Totally. So yeah, that was one thing. Yeah, exactly. That's why I asked because oftentimes when we go that opposite way to create that magnetism, I find that like yeah. the negative polarity always shows up for us and it makes us exactly. stronger and more resilient, which I love that we're going to talk about Sarasati on the podcast today because I know that that's like another huge misconception that when we're going through this, um, period in our um, astrology chart that, yeah, again, like we're doomed and gloom. So I would love yeah. to for me first to just define what is Sarasati and yeah, what does it mean? Okay, so Sarasati is actually related to the planet Saturn. Okay, and Saturn transit transits a particular house for 2.5 years, actually not a particular house, but a particular sign for 2.5 years. It is the heaviest planet and it is the very, uh, you know, slow moving planet. So that is why it takes a lot of time to transit through one sign. And this is like uh, the longest of all the planets. Mm -hmm. So what happens is whenever Saturn transits one house back and uh, over the moon and then one house uh, after the moon, that is the period which is known as Sarasati. And basically why this period is very uh, impactful is because Sa Saturn, uh, you might have heard about the mythology. Saturn has been a planet who is more towards karma, more towards reality, more towards being fair to everyone. 
Saturn is not the planet who is going to see if you are rich or poor. He is just going to punish you for the deeds you have done. So what happens is that during this period, all the past life karmas and all the existing life past karmas just get into uh, you know that phase and you have to face it it's like the product karma that you can't change you just have to face it totally so that is what sarasati is so you mentioned two and a half years is the whole time yeah. period seven and a half yes it's actually three houses three signs right and 2.5 uh, years each so uh, so as a uh, whole it becomes 7.5 years and then when does it go over the moon? It, does it happen differently for each person depending on their chart? Yes, actually it happens for the, um, you know, different people according to the houses. But actually, what is it that the first phase is going to be before moon? The second phase is actually the peak phase. We call it peak phase because it is over the moon. The Saturn is over the moon. And then it is the, the uh, last phase is known as the, uh, you know, declining phase. But mostly people say that the declining phase is good. It, what happens is that uh, Saturn takes away everything in the first phase. Then it builds up the pressure in the second phase. And then it gives you everything. But it doesn't happen like this for, for everyone. It depends on one person's natal chart that how it is going to happen. It depends on the houses. Because not everyone is going to have a moon in the same uh, house. Totally. Yeah, so that, makes, that yeah. makes so much sense. And I know for our listeners, they'll understand that too. Because um, Vedic astrology, that's how it is. It's so personal to your chart. And that makes sense. Yes. That's just how yeah. Vedic wisdom is. It's the same thing with Ayurveda. You have to know your constitution yeah. and your doshic imbalance. So what is okay. the significance of this time period? Why do we have to go through this? I think uh, the significance is that, uh, you know, uh, we call it like uh, a coal is turned into a diamond in this period. So, you know, uh, when it's the mining of coal, uh, the, uh, the workers basically you know hit the coal with the uh, you know iron or anything like any hard uh, uh, you know tools and then it is turned into a diamond so that is similar with the people also people uh, basically saturn gives very hard lessons it makes you face the reality it makes you go through situations where you are left totally alone totally helpless and they are uh, i think when it's about particularly about Sarasati, when it's affecting the moon, there's there's like a lot of fluctuations of emotions. There is like waves and tides of emotions. So it makes you go through it to reach that level where you are more mature and where you are more practical about things. You know what is real life. You're not in that la-la land anymore. Totally. So you're currently in your Sarasati, correct? Yes, yes. I'm in the peak phase. You're in the peak phase. So yeah. if whatever you, would, you feel comfortable sharing with our audience, but I think yeah, that would, sure. like giving any specific example would be really helpful. What has been the progression uh -huh. of your experience with Sadasati? Okay, so very honestly, I would say that my first phase was very, very difficult for me. I told you like back in 2017, it started, I remember in November 2017, and uh, I was totally clueless about what was happening. Like it was all fine before that. It was all going good. I had everything in my life. My life was smooth and suddenly things started to deteriorate. People started to leave. I started to have different uh, moods and different, I, it was like very, uh, it's, it was like a lot of confusions back then. So uh, according to me, the first phase was actually quite, uh, it teached me a lot of things and it led me to a better life, I would say. Um, uh, I had a, uh, you know, I didn't have any clue and any vis vision in my life. There was no goal in my life. I was just flowing. I was just, I would, that will, I would say I will, I was in a la la land, but, uh, when I went through that time, I was, you know, I got that reality check. I got that practicality that how I should deal with things and how I should feel things actually, because it's more so related to moon, moon is your emotions, moon is your comfort. Saturn takes you out of your comforts. Totally. But the second phase, I would say the second phase was rather more uh, better 
because what happens is that you have already faced that heavy karma in the first then by this time uh, the second phase you become more used to it and you know how to deal with it so it was better i love that what yeah. specific house or sign were you going through during that phase uh during the first phase yes that was uh, when saturn was in sagittarius got it yeah. and so what does that mean um like if someone is someone's mm -hmm. chart when was in that specific sign uh huh okay so actually saturn doesn't behave similar for every sign right because we have 12 signs and uh, we have nine planets and every sign behaves differently and every planet behaves differently in every sign so uh, it's not necessary that everyone is going to face uh, there are some fundamental uh, you know points that everyone is going to face in sarasati but specifically how when we go deeper into the analysis then it's more about the signs like in sagittarius sign sagittarius is the natural ninth house and ninth house is related to higher learning it is related to optimism it is related to uh, good your gurus your teachers it is related to long distance travel all of that so what happens is whenever saturn comes into the ninth house it is also the house of luck so uh, saturn delays your luck you mm -hmm. get everything uh, although Sat uh, sagittarius is a very optimistic sign but saturn is in itself is an orthodox and pessimistic sign so it's you know these are uh, both polar uh, energies so they uh, they are together in a house so it's like your optimism gets uh, pessimistic you know they uh, it it comes like that so this was one thing that happened with me a lot of times whenever i want i uh, was all happy and hopeful about things saturn used to do something or the other like that and i i was forced to be pessimistic i was forced to feel negative about things and the other thing is that in sagittarius saturn behaves quite lethargic so i think whoever it's not just about one person whoever has wherever their uh, sagittarius falls the person would feel uh, frustrated and uh, lethargic about that particular area in their life mm. that's so interesting i'm curious to hear for any of your clients what um houses have they gone through in their sadasatis and mm -hmm. like any specific examples that you can give for certain signs where you felt like there was a common theme that keeps coming up yeah so there was a client of mine i remember cancer ascendant so uh, when saturn was in the sign uh, of sagittarius it was in the 6th house so what happens is whenever it's in the 6th house and uh, you'll you'll also see about this about cancer ascendant people or even cancer moon people that these people are happy go lucky people and they just you know that why is that so because their 6th house is sagittarius that means that their optimistic behavior their high spirited behavior is going to lead them into conflicts okay so they're they're so all over the place you know they are emotional but uh, they're uh, you know high spirited behavior and they they want all the freedom in the world and because of that they get into conflicts so what happened was when when saturn added was uh, coming in the 6th uh, house in the sign of sagittarius such a person uh, went through a court case and went through major conflicts in marriage so because 6th house is also it's actually 12th from the 7th house and 7th house is the house of marriage so 6th house denotes the conflicts of marriage and it also it also represents the visas like whenever we uh, file anything legal it's it can be uh, travel visas or it can be your pr permanent residency like here in india a lot of people apply that when they are in overseas right so that also is represented by the 6th house so what happens is whenever a planet transits and especially when it's saturn or it's jupiter the house gets activated now it depends wherever jupiter is placed that is going to tell if the uh, result is going to be positive or negative so it's always one after another thing in the analysis so but the main thing that is it activates is that it activates some conflict it activates some legal cases or some legal documentations for a person 
and then it comes into the seventh house then it it's in, it is more about it can give you a relationship a stable relationship a marriage so that's how uh, the transit of saturn works wow so fascinating because there's so many moving pieces and other different aspects yeah. to it um but it's really reassuring again and cool to see that like everyone can be so unique in their in their own way so for, personally yeah. my sarasati um i don't remember no it started in 2012 and then it went okay. it just finished in 2019 i think that would mean okay so are you like libra uh, libra moon i guess um, I think I'm, so. I'm Scorpio moon. Scorpio. Actually. Yeah, Scorpio Libra. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that <laughs> must have been very intense. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Scorpio moon yeah. is very, yeah, it was really intense. So yeah, the, it didn't start for me like right in 2012. It, it, it kind of started uh -huh. probably in that um, second phase when it was over the moon. Just because Scorpio okay. moon is probably yeah. debilitated, that makes sense. It is debilitated, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I feel that Scorpio, having a Scorpio moon is much, much better than having a Taurus moon in this, in this era, you know, in this generation. Yeah, I love it. And honestly, what's really interesting yeah. about the Scorpio moon is my business partner, Rachel, Scorpio moon, and a lot of my uh -huh. family members and a lot of my friends all have Scorpio moons too. So it's really weird uh -huh. how like, I don't know if you've noticed that too. You connect, yeah. Yeah, you really connect with them. But I I, yeah. I feel like um, it's really used for deep transformation. And I, I love that feeling exactly. of like getting out of the mud and going into that, that resiliency. Exactly. Not when I'm in the mud, it's not so fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that. <laughs> But I, I will say also, so what's interesting about mine is that my Sarasati, um, and then I went straight into my Saturn return. And I found that okay. my, um, at the end of my Sarasati, I actually felt it more than being in my Saturn return. I'm like, okay, it's difficult, but I'm not like that. I don't know that ending streak was different for me. So that's interesting how you said, uh -huh. like, just depending on the houses and what it goes through, it can be different yeah. for everyone. Exactly. So... I would love to hear what are some of your tools that you give your clients mm -hmm. or that you've used in your Sadasati um, to help appease some of this like tense, lonely and highly emotional energy. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing that I suggest everyone, and I did that myself as well, was meditation. I'm telling you spirituality and meditation actually helped me to go through that period. And, you know, one thing, one is a very common uh, pattern that I have observed with the Sarasati is whenever it's the starting of your Sarasati, if within the starting phase, a person gets into astrology. Somehow a person gets into astrology because that time becomes so confusing that a person uh, wants to look for the answers that why this is happening with me. Oh, really? Why? Right. So that why basically takes them to uh, astrology. And that takes them to spirituality as well. So meditation, I think that is the uh, a very good tool to get through this uh, time because you you know Saturn makes your head work all the time. Even when you sleep, you'll feel that you're you're thinking something. There are thoughts in your mind. So with meditation, there's a clarity there, so you can have better decisions with that. And second thing, which I basically uh, did uh, in uh, this period was that I was, I took myself more around animals. I don't know if that happens for everyone, but I asked that uh, with my clients as well. And there was one client I could, I could remember of, again, she was Cancer Ascendant. She had Jupiter, Venus in the Ascendant and Pushya Nakshatra. It's like a very good placement. And she was also going through her Sadasati and I, asked her how you're dealing with uh, that and she said that I had I, I have three cats and two dogs and I'm telling you this is my happy place oh. and same was the thing with me my dog was my happy place all this time oh I love that yeah I think that really to me that sounds like getting closer to nature and like in whatever yeah. way that is like animals to me exactly. are nature because they're just in its purest form and exactly. just yeah, that's so interesting that you said like just getting into spirituality because that was actually my experience. I mean, I started in 2012 was the year I started yoga and that's how I got into Vedic wisdom. Oh, yeah. um, and then that just like ripple effect into everything. And my meditation practice uh -huh. started around there too, but it definitely went through a lot of 
phases and ups and downs of four exactly. and six and became a consistent practice. But I really don't know what, where I would be without meditation because like yeah. you said, there's so many, there's so much chatter and noise that happens and so many conflicting mm-hmm. things. If I didn't have a release, it would be so hard to one, just like remain sane, but two, being able to listen to the voice of your highest self, because ultimately having that come through and that strengthens your connection to source, to God and strengthens your spirituality. Yeah, it does. Definitely. So I love to hear now, how does Sarasati differ than Saturn return? Okay. So Saturn return is basically when uh, your Saturn comes to your natal Saturn in the transit, right? So for example, if a person has Saturn and Capricorn, so right now uh, from 2020 January, they are going through their Saturn uh, natal return, right? So what happens is in Sarasati, there are the Saturn is transiting near to the moon, but in Saturn natal, natal return, the Saturn comes over the natal Saturn only. So it is. it affects just one house. So it is going to give the result of that particular house only. So what happens is the major result that Saturn gives with Saturn return is that it wants you to mend the house it sits in. Mm-hmm. Like wherever Saturn is sitting, you, you have to face major karma related to that house. Like, for example, if your Saturn is in the fourth house, like Lord Rama had his Saturn in the fourth house. So he had to face a a karma related to mother figure. And he did that. He went on uh, 14 years, uh, you know, in the jungle and lived there. So that is how Saturn makes you, um, you know, that Saturn plays out. So while natal return happens, this this thing get triggers. Right. So it but it affects just that particular house only. The karma is related to that particular house only. But in Sarasati, it is actually all your past life karmas which come in because that is for 2.5 years only the natal return and Sarasati is for 7.5 years. So the duration is also long enough. So this is one major difference. So would you say, energetically, what would you say is the difference? Would you say that Sarasati is heavier and it can be more difficult and challenging? I think, yes, Sarasati is more challenging than natal return because it, uh, you know, it has number of effects, but natal return that is just confined to one particular house and the significance of that house only. Totally. And about Sarasati too, I wanted to ask, do we, um, mm-hmm. can, can you go through multiple in a lifetime or does everyone go through multiple in a lifetime? Yes, everyone does. Like, uh, it's not necessary that you're going to uh, face the karma for this life. It's like your multiple lives, your past lives, all the past lives that you have. Even we don't, I, I, I told in the very first uh, uh, few minutes that it's the prarabd karma that we have to face. And prarabd karma is something that we have carried forward in this life that we can't deny because we don't know anything about it. That is in the past lives. So this is the thing. I'd love to hear either a personal story or any of your uh-huh. clients how they have gotten out of the mud of the energy of Saturn and really use that to transform and really step into their power and who they are. Okay, so I would mention my personal story here. I I used to be like a very introvert child. I used to be a child of, since I'm a Capricorn, so I I don't like to deal with other people, you know, a lot of people. It like frustrates me, like, why are there so many people around me? So I've been very like, uh, you know, Saturn, the sign of Saturn, Capricorn is the sign of Saturn. So it makes you feel lonely. It makes you feel more inward than go- going outward and being social with people. So I've been very introvert from the beginning. I've been very lonely from the beginning, but what happened in the Sarasati was that I met a lot of people and uh, I didn't have the confidence to speak. You know, right now also I'm speaking to you a few few, uh, years back, I might not have done this. Mm -hmm. Like I would get that bitters, I would get that, you know, anxiety at that very point. But what it did was it built a lot of confidence in me. It built uh, that thing in me that I now I know 
that yeah i have that confidence and i i know how to interact with people i don't get scared of things very easily i don't get that anxiety very easily now so th- my confidence was one thing that was triggered a lot and uh, it actually made me a good and confident person after that oh i i love that so much i yeah that's what i not love well kind of i love the energy of saturn for that reason because it's that great yeah. teacher within us and it pulls out that part that we need it's not the lessons that we want but the lessons that we need and i i really yeah. feel that for my um you know sarasati and now going into my saturn return i went through a big phase of having to let go things like alcohol and you know just a life of yeah. living more like un uh, consciously um not Mm -hmm. that it was ever like a huge problem i feel really fortunate for that um but as i got more into my spirituality i realized i just didn't need these certain things in my life anymore and now that i have like gotten through that phase and i'm on the other side of that i have so much more confidence in being truthful to who i am and not needing any substances or anything like that to to get in the way yeah i you know uh, here i would mention one thing i've seen one thing with water signs whenever sarasati comes with the water signs because you'll always see whenever there there are heavy placements with water signs people actually get indulged in substances because these people are so emotional that they don't know how to let you know okay. let out those emotions so alcohol or substance is a way of them of letting out all the pain so whenever sarasati comes in this is the first thing which gets affected wow and actually what happens is it gets amplified first and then it is uh, you know god it gets down yeah that like nailed it that it that's exactly yeah. what happened and yeah. it's so it's so interesting you said that cuz i totally believe that that's actually been um a lot of my mm-hmm. past has been avoiding emotions and just not knowing how yeah. to process it and i felt like yeah. when probably the reason why towards the end of my sadasati i started to feel all the emotions more is cuz i didn't have alcohol mm-hmm. to suppress it so when you don't have that yeah. anymore then it was like whoa this is what it feels yeah. like to actually try to <laughs> exactly. process all of these it was really intense and yeah. yeah that was like a whole thing and now I feel so much it's now it's one of my gifts of like being able exactly. to intuitively feel others emotions and being able to process my own emotions which happens to be what the collective is often feeling has been uh-huh. such a strength of mine and now I see it as such a gift. So I love Saturn energy for that. It's like turning the challenges and that mud into that beautiful blooming lotus flower. Yeah, definitely. and you know that actually reminded me of anuradha nakshatra because that is the significance that's a lotus in the muddy water yeah. and that is ruled by saturn only oh i would love that that yeah. is that's rachel yeah. my my founder or my partner co-founder that's her uh-huh. um moon nakshatra nakshatra okay i <laughs> i love anuradha uh, nakshatra energy to be honest yeah it's it's such a beautiful one i i love that too what what's your nakshatra mine is uttarashad oh what the invincible what? star oh, i love that <laughs> we call it the uh, undefeatable star <laughs> that's that's what i actually got into emotionally you know i felt defeated all over the time i would say like from the very uh, childhood like i was very small i used to feel very defeated emotionally to be honest but now i just feel like nobody can defeat me emotionally oh. because i am strong enough you know oh. I love that so much. Yeah. So currently, what is one of your favorite parts about the chart to um come back to? Like whenever you're feeling like, "Oh, I feel disconnected from my highest self" or I'm uh-huh. feeling kind of off, what can you really anchor in? Cuz there's so many aspects to the chart. So what is one that like yeah. really you feel connected to when you come back to? So, uh you know, whenever a person feels disappointed, um uh, i think everyone should go back to their jupiter because jupiter is one planet which brings in that optimism which brings the in that hope you'll always see that people who have debilitated jupiter they find it the hardest to believe that there is something better in the future they'll always be in that present situation and they'll feel pity about the present situation that this happened or oh, no our life is doomed all of that So Jupiter is one planet if that is placed very well 
that actually makes you go through a go through a lot of things although mars is also uh, associated somehow because that is the uh, that is the planet for courage but i think jupiter is more so related to your subconscious mind because it rules the 12th house and the 9th house so 9th house is your higher self it's what you believe in and 12th house is what you subconsciously believe in mm-hmm. so i think jupiter is and you know um, Fortunately, I have a very good Jupiter because I have it in the ascendant in Mooltrakona sign, oh, wow. and that is Virgotma as well. So I I think that is the strongest element in my chart. I feel because it is uh, it has all the power, you know, whichever we call it, call it uh, Virgotma, call it Pushkara Navamsha, call it Mooltrakona. Mine is there. It is in my chart. So that is one thing. that my jupiter actually makes me feel very optimistic so whenever i'm down whenever whenever i'm not feeling because sometimes consultations also not do not go well you know there are some people and you know we being astrologers or you being a healer we people take on a lot of energies from other people and the those can be positive those can be negative so whenever it happens i just uh, you know open my chart and i look on my jupiter i really do that and i just stay there uh, and i'm like it's okay it's okay <laughs> let's understand it let's be optimistic oh, the god has given me something you know oh i so, love that so much yeah. i i'm almost positive rachel's jupiter is in her um first house as well uh-huh. and that okay. like and that and that guides it which is awesome what what sign okay. is your jupiter in sagittarius mool trigon sign oh yeah. wow okay yeah. amazing <laughs> i yeah. love that my my jupiter is in leo and i actually relate that wow I relate to that a lot uh-huh. when i that's like a very open and like a big heart a hearted personality you know you have a huge heart when you oh. want to help people you just don't look anywhere else you just do it oh Yeah, I I totally feel that. And, and like so my western in my western chart my sun sign was Leo uh-huh. and when I first learned my Vedic chart and I was like sun is not in Leo. Oh my gosh, I relate to Leo and I do so much, but it yeah. was so great to get that specificity because my Venus is in Leo as well. So I felt like okay. those two planets both being there that really spoke to me. And now what you just what you just uh-huh. explained so beautifully like that that resonates a lot as well. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> I I want to talk back about cuz you mentioned Rahu is often mm-hmm. um which is referenced as the north node or that's yeah. the best easily translation for Vedic astrology mm-hmm. but Rahu is often really misconstrued and I love yeah. for you to explain Rahu cuz um even me I just started to learn Vedic astrology but very mm-hmm. early on, I'm just in my first year but I mm-hmm. often have a hard time grasping Rahu as well so I'd love to hear mm-hmm. your perspective on Rahu and what Rahu represents uh-huh. so basically uh, Rahu and Ketu the mythological explanation to it is that it was a uh, one man who was cut into half right so Rahu is the head of that person and uh, the uh, Ketu is the body so we need to take Rahu as just the head just consider it to be a head and it it doesn't have the body so it always plays with your head first of all because it only has that organ that is present in him it's just the head it is just the brain so first of all rahu what rahu does it it makes you think a lot wherever rahu is placed you are going to be obsessive about that particular thing but you are not going to make a lot of efforts towards that piece like for example if a person has second house rahu a person is going to think a lot about finances about income about whether i can get uh, money from here from there but they won't do anything about it because ketu is not present there ketu is in the 8th house they'll research a lot of things because 8th house is about research digging deep into things right so they'll research a lot of things about it but they won't take any actions for it Mm-hmm. So Rahu is that energy which just keeps you occu- occupied in thinking a lot of things because it plays with uh, with your thoughts with your emotions as well because moon is the mind there and Rahu Ketu are the nodes of moon as well so moon also the placement of moon also depends right the other thing is that Rahu is a uh, you know since it is the the face it is the head it wants to get everything you know it's like he wants to have it have it have it there's no there's endless hunger 
so if if it's in the second house if it's in the artha houses a person is very much career oriented if it's in the moksha houses which is 4 8 and 12 houses then a person wants all the pleasures in the world happiness in the world they have a lot of desires to complete emotional desires and and if it is in the trick houses which is third and 11th rahu is more so uh, about you know manipulating things manipulating and uh, it's more about being uh, having a lot of communication with other people and gaining from that gaining uh, fulfilling their desires from that so rahu just wants everything but the difference between rahu and other planets is that rahu can do you know things which are which can be unethical actually but uh, it's not necessary that it's completely unethical because we look for aspects we look for jupiter's aspects we will look for mars aspect if that is there then this rahu is controlled but rahu is naturally a malefic energy but let me tell you it is also the bhoga karka so whenever rahu comes into the any house like suppose rahu is coming over the seventh house it is going to give you relationships because it is the bhoga karka bhoga means that that thing is going to come into your life you are going to get this so one thing is there that rahu and jupiter mahadasha comes like uh, first it's rahu mahadasha then it's jupiter mahadasha so people say that jupiter mahadasha is more better because it is the most benefic planet but i would say that rahu is actually the most um, brilliant mahadasha to have because rahu is going to give you everything wow and jupiter is not actually going to give you anything because right. it is going to teach you first right so this reminded me of one of one of my clients uh, like he lived he uh, he was living in canada right so uh, he just got there on uh, like uh, with the usual process of student visa and all of that stuff and what happened was that he became millionaire literally he became millionaire with a bank job Uh, and some other things as well because he was very much into how to earn money and all of that so he became uh, very rich in the rahu rahu period when rahu period started and then as soon as rahu jupiter started because after rahu rahu we have rahu jupiter right so when rahu jupiter started all his money went out wow. and at that point he came to me and uh, he uh, asked me that should i do this like she he he wanted to go back because he was because he was bankrupt he couldn't pay off any of the you know money and he was like i i, I think i need to run wow so this was what how you know immediately jupiter till, uh, you know transformed his situation wow. so rahu is good in certain ways totally that's a perfect yeah. example it's really interesting cuz in western astrology a lot of times it's explained that the north node is kind of what your purpose is in this life and i yes, think that's yes. really interesting because rahu represents that materialism so it's like what exactly. can we bring in this physical realm and i think that gets misconstrued sometimes as what is my purpose and what am i going to be in this lifetime on this earth plane yeah. but really in vedic astrology it's more just on that materialistic plane like actually bringing Yeah. physical things into this earth and i think that again why it gets confused with jupiter probably is because jupiter is abundance and we all think yeah. that abundance means yeah. physical objects all the time which it totally can yeah. that's not the totality of what real abundance is yeah but you know i have seen rahu uh, not only it's about materialism it can even be about spirituality mm -hmm. like i have seen people with the, whenever rahu is transiting over the 9th house or it is transiting over the 12th house or there's there's one thing in uh, uh, mahadashas that we see that is trabhagi analysis so in trabhagi we divide uh, the mahadasha into three parts and then we uh, uh, ana analyze from that particular sign like mm -hmm. for example when rahu comes in then we look for all the air signs right for 6 6 years so for it, it it is the 18 years long period right so we divide it into three parts and we get a uh, three six year long periods and those will be ruled first time with the uh, gemini then with libra then with aquarius so these are the signs so whenever it comes into the moksha houses from these signs then a person is more inclined towards spirituality wow 
so rahu can also make you go through spirituality but the one thing is that it won't make you religious it would it it will make you go out of the boundaries because rahu is the outcast it wants to break the boundaries it doesn't want to be confined in a place like saturn does saturn is also a rebel but saturn has some set of rules saturn has an area like if i am saturn i'm only going to be confined in this particular place only i'm not going to go out of that but rahu rahu wants to go out of that mm. so this is one thing with rahu that makes so much sense and for our listeners can you just explain what a mahadasha is for them okay so mahadasha is actually a time period that is ruled by a particular planet and uh, that the significance of that planet and the houses that uh, that particular planet rules those are the theme that we are going to play out for those long years like here we are talking about rahu it is for 80 it this the mahadasha of rahu comes for 18 long years so wherever rahu is placed and i would rather say wherever rahu ketu are placed because rahu ketu axis is uh, the axis where you are going to go back and forth all your life so whenever rahu mahadasha comes in you are going to go back and forth in those houses in those rahu ketu houses so the effect of rahu will be seen over those 18 years so that is one that is the mahadasha awesome thank you thank you for that clarity um there's so much information here i know so yeah. many people are going to be spinning for our listeners but i thank you so much for that and i just want to ask my last question what uh-huh. aspect of the chart are you currently learning about cuz as we said this wisdom is timeless and there's always new pieces that we're pulling from yeah Um so yeah. what part of the chart are you kind of learning more about and wanting to dive in deeper? Okay so that will be actually the first house and the 10th house. And the why I'm saying that because first house is actually our identity. And you know uh, by talking to so many people through my work I've realized that people do not know what their identity what their truest self is. So the first house digging deep into the first house a person gets to know what they are and what they are here for because naturally the first house is their soul because sun gets exalted there so that's your personality that's your soul that's what you are here to experience and why 10th house that i would say that is the actions that you are go- going to do mars is exalted there because mars is your energy and mars is your actions right so 10th house basically tells that how you are going to play out your personality how you are going to play out your first house so these are the two houses that i personally try to uh, research on for myself and for other people as well so that there's a clarity why we are here i love that i i totally agree i think that identity and knowing the truth of who we are is so important and i love that simplicity too of just focusing yeah. on the first house cuz it it guides so much of the chart exactly beautiful. Well, this was so informative. Um and I know our listeners are probably going to want to listen to this multiple times and save it yeah. for when they are going through their sarasati or sad in return and need some of that wisdom and and advice getting them through it, but I would love for you to share how our listeners can work with you um and get to mm-hmm. experience more of your magic. Okay. So, uh I actually consider astrology more psychological than uh, a remedial measure. So I think uh, your users can actually work regarding knowing what's there for them and how they can deal with that mm. particular thing. Like for example if there's a problem that can uh, you know hinder their peace or that can uh, bring uh, some obstacles in their life then with astrology they can know that okay this problem is going to reach us then you can have a strategic layout to that problem that how you're going to deal with it. so i take astrology that way and i recommend people to take astrology you know take consultations for astrology just for this purpose to so as to know that how you can deal with the things how you can be a better person rather than just being scared of what you are given by the god totally yeah 
Yeah, yeah I, I love your perspective on that. And how, what is the best way they can work with you in your offerings? Do you do full chart readings? Yeah, I do chart readings basically on the basis of uh, different areas. Like I have diff I have career readings separate, marriage readings separate, and I also have uh, readings which are like, uh, there's like full analysis, like you can uh, ask anything about it, your spiritual progress, your, about your children, because from your from our chart, from one person's chart, like if I'm reading my own chart, I cannot just predict about myself. I can predict about my father, my mother, my siblings, and my children as well. So that comes under full analysis. So this is the categories I deal in. So people can have consultations regarding what area of focus they have, and then they can discuss uh, with me that over Skype call, or they can have email audio reports from me. So that's how it works. I love that so much because, yeah, there's so many aspects of the chart that I feel like that's so great for everyone just to sort of dip their toes in or at least focus on what they want to focus on in that moment in their time in their life. Um, yeah. That's so perfect. So we'll link your website in our show notes so everyone can can look at that and look at that offering. And I also recommend following um, Anmal and her Instagram. I love your videos. You always bring up Hi. different things that your clients are going through and you explain it in such a clear and detailed and specific way that just makes it's so lighthearted and joyful and I just love that psychological piece that you speak on too because this it, it's we're meant to empower everyone like you have these tools yeah. and knowing this information can feel so relieving I feel relieved even just the few things that you've shared with me knowing about my chart a little yeah. bit more so yeah. um, thank you so much for your wisdom and your time today you're most welcome beautiful everyone well thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time